practitioner world. So it's a thrill to have him here. The Environmental Change and Security Program, we're in our 14th year. Uh, and we try to facilitate this practitioner scholar discussion and debate in the areas of environment, population, health, development, foreign policy, and security policy. And so, obviously, discussing the li linkages between uh, environment and migration uh, falls uh, directly in um, our bailiwick. Uh, this meeting is um, so many of our meetings uh, for quite a few years now is very generously supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health, and so it's a thrill to see some of the folks uh, from that office, but also importantly from some of the other offices that aid here as well. So we're um, uh, thankful for that support um, as we've um, had that partnership for many years now. Uh, let me just say a word about our speakers. We have bios on the on the handout, so I won't go through them extensively, in part because you're far more interested in hearing from them um, than hearing me. Uh, before I do that, I will just mention that we are webcasting this meeting live, um, and we have the ability to uh, get questions if folks watching online would like to e email them to ecsp at wilsoncenter.org. Um, but what that means for us in the room uh, is really just when we come to the Q&A period, I ask that you wait for one of my colleagues to bring you a microphone, let us know who you are, and, and pose your question to the mic so folks online can hear it as well. I think we're also in the situation for folks online can go to the web page and pull down the, the PowerPoint slides uh, so that you don't have to try to squint at the screen and see what's going on uh, watching it remotely. Uh, so let me just say, it's a great pleasure. Uh, Judy Oglethorpe from WWF and Janet Edmund from CI are our regular um, partners in crime. <laughs> They're recidivists here at the center, and so we're thrilled to be working with them once again as uh, two of the co-authors of this report, and it was talking with Judy and, and Janet, as we do uh, many times, that this opportunity came to pass, and we're very thankful for them participating. Judy, I think, is going to kick us off. Uh, as many of you know, she's Director of Community Conservation at WWF and is a real uh, leader in the field, both at WWF, but also really the larger PHE field uh, on these issues. And so it's uh, terrific that she'll going to be our, our scene setter. Uh, I think we'll go next to Keith Alger, who is Vice President, Head of Human Dimensions Program at Conservation International. Uh, he's head of the Center, uh, Center for Applied Biodiversity Science there uh, and is someone who's spent a lot of time in the field that can really um, he's going to present one of the two case studies from Latin America that we're going to be discussing today. So it's terrific that um, uh, Keith is here today. Then we also, for the other case study, have Lauren Spurrier, who's Managing Director of WWF's Galapagos Program, a gig that I can imagine once one gets never wants to give up. Uh, it's got to be uh, one of the most special places on earth. And so it's terrific to have Lauren um, talking about the experience there and the really um, uh, tremendous and, and uh, fascinating challenges that, that migration poses in, in that part of the world. Um, and finally, Michael White, whom I mentioned is a former Wilson Center scholar. Uh, we'd like to think that's his kind of most distinguishing um, identification and affiliation, but he also happens to be Director of Population Studies and Training Center and Professor of Sociology at Brown University, a demographer who spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, the connections between people moving and the environment particular uh, interest in urban areas, a particular interest in uh, West Africa, and so it's terrific to have Michael back at the center again. So I think I will turn the floor over to Judy and look forward to the presentations. We'll save the questions for a Q&A uh, session at the end. Judy. Thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, I think this may, you may have to do this. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Um, so if we could have the first slide, please. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, this is really, for us, it's, uh, it's an official launch of this document, which has been a long time in the making. Um, we've traveled a long way. We've learned a lot in, in the process. I want to start just a little bit uh, talking about how this study came about. We were getting a lot of requests from conservation practitioners in the field, particularly in developing countries, who are faced with a lot of human migration people moving into protected areas, into forests, into coastal areas, um, often very suddenly and without much warning. And people were saying, well, what do we do about it? Um, you know, these are people who are foresters and wildlife managers and don't have much experience dealing with, with social, socioeconomic issues. Um, so we decided to explore this issue. We, we had an initial meeting of the Africa Biodiversity Collaborative Group and the Community Conservation Coalition, a joint meeting 
where we drew in migration experts and biodiversity experts, and we really explored, you know, what is the universe of, of this problem and what are some of, the, some of the things that we can do to resolve these problems. After the meeting, uh, Janet Edmund and I got together. We both were running population programs, but really focusing on family planning and reproductive health in our organizations. We realized that, hey, you know, there's a whole other side of the coin in migration to, to our population programs. We agreed to collaborate on this. So CI funded a series of case studies which Jenny Erickson, who's sitting here, uh, masterminded. And uh, Richard Billsborough from University of North Carolina undertook a review of, of the major issues and some of the main policy interventions that were possible. Um, we wanted to pilot some of the approaches we heard about. We didn't actually manage to get funding, so we decided let's go ahead, develop a framework for possible interventions, put it out there as an exploratory document, and use that as a launching point to go forward. So that's where we are today. We've, we've done the document, um, and we're really sort of now looking forward to where do we go next. So the scope of this review, it mainly covers migration in, de in the developing world. We know there are huge uh, migration issues in the developed world, including Europe and, and in the US, but we, we didn't cover that. We were covering impacts on biodiversity in the developing world and really looking at what are the adverse impacts of biodiversity as well. We know there are some impacts that actually can help conservation a lot, but we're looking at the problems in order to solve them. So we're looking at the adverse impacts. Um, we were looking at solutions not only for biodiversity, but also for the local people living close to that biodiversity, the long-term residents, who are the long-term stewards of those areas and, and, and of those natural resources. And then finally, we recognize that many migrants move because they're forced to, um, because of persecution, because of conflict, because of poverty. And so we have to have a human face when we approach this problem. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Just want to acknowledge very briefly, very many people helped us with this. Um, two donors, USAID uh, was very generous in helping us with the consultancies and the publication. Um, this is both the uh, Office of Natural Resources Management through the Global Conservation Program and the Office of Population and Reproductive Health in the Global Health Bureau. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation provided funding through CI as well, and we're very grateful for all that support. Um, I've mentioned Jenny and Dick's key roles in this. Uh, Janet Edmund, who's sitting next to Jenny, also played a key role uh, in authoring, analyzing, and really keeping us on target when we were trying to produce. She, she was the one who cracked the whip. Um, a very big thanks to all the conservation practitioners who contributed, and there were very many of them, uh, particularly those who worked on the case studies. Many people reviewed this, it was peer reviewed, and we really appreciate all the thoughtful comments that they gave us. They really helped us improve the document a lot. And then finally, all those who helped in the production. So that's the, that's the setting, that's the background. I'm now gonna go through really briefly some of the main findings, particularly focusing on the interventions before the others speak about the case studies and Michael gets a chance to reply. So adverse impacts of migration, they're the ones that you know, we might expect loss of species, habitat loss, loss of ecological connectivity when, when habitats are fragmented, disruption of ecological processes, mangroves destroyed, cloud forests destroyed, and then loss of livelihoods for long-term residents if they get migrants piling in and competing with them for land and resources. Thank you. Um, some of the direct threats that we're facing well, unsustainable use of resources. It may be timber, it may be bushmeat, um, maybe fish, habitat destruction, pollution. Pollution can be a big uh, issue in, in some areas. Spread of invasive species and disease. Migrants very often take these with them. And then climate change. Migrants moving into the, into the Amazon basin, for instance, and deforesting are causing local climate change, which may also have global ramifications. Thank you. Um, the migration that has bad infect, impacts on biodiversity is often rural to rural, and it's a migration you don't hear about. Demographers usually focus on urban drift, so they focus on people moving from rural areas to urban areas. That doesn't have so much of an impact for us usually, unless there are urban impacts on fuel wood and bushmeat and so on, but usually it's people moving rural to rural, which is often undocumented and is, is on a huge scale sometimes. Um, we also have people moving out of urban areas into rural areas, for example, when economies are on a downturn, and that can also have big impacts. 
Very often it's internal within a country, although migrants may also be crossing borders. Um, most of the impacts are caused in destination areas. That's the areas, those are the areas where we really focus, but sometimes also in areas of origin. Unlike population growth due to fertility, migration can happen incredibly quickly. So populations can suddenly grow. Um, you know, if you look at the number of people, for example, who fled from Rwanda during the genocide in 1994, that happened within the space of a week or so. Uh, migration can be temporary or permanent. And then also very importantly, there can also be second generation impacts if human fertility is high. And Lauren will be, I think, talking a bit more about this later for the Galapagos. Thanks. Um, just some statistics. This uh, amazing picture here is people moving out of the Rwandans, moving out of the camps in Tanzania in 1996 when the Tanzanian government closed them, moving back to Rwanda after the genocide. Thank you. So what causes migration? We all know that there are push factors and there are pull factors. The push factors that we're most concerned about are scarcity of land or lack of access to land. Sometimes it occurs because populations are growing through natural growth. Sometimes it's because people have moved in and pushed people off their prime land. This happened a lot in colonial times and it continues to happen. Uh, lack of economic opportunities is another one, obviously poverty. Um, natural disasters. Uh, which we're seeing even, even in developed countries. Um, and obviously civil unrest and, and conflict, which is a huge uh, effect in Africa. And rites of passage. In Madagascar, for instance, young men go out into the world from remote villages to prove themselves. And they, uh, they go out, try to make their fortunes, come back with cattle so that they can marry and raise their status in society. So all these reasons for, for, uh, for migration as push factors. And then the pull factors, access to a better life. So more land, more resources, employment, access to markets and so on and so forth. Access to safety and security as well. So while a lot of people may be moving to areas around roads, at times of conflict, maybe people may be going deeper into forests to find security, to hide away. And um, for example, in the Congo Basin, there are a lot of displaced people still who are living off bushmeat and having huge impacts on wildlife populations. Uh, they're still afraid to return to the areas they came from, reestablish their agriculture. And then family reunification of networks. Once one person in a family has gone, and they very often will say, it's great over here, the grass is much better on, on this side, uh, they encourage other people to come. Even if actually life on the frontier is very, very tough. It's, it's in human nature. You don't want to come home and admit defeat. You want to say it's good. And so very often that can cause avalanches of migration, even if conditions aren't any better in the new area. Thanks. Um, and what are the future trends? Well, probably migration is only going to increase, including the migration that has serious impacts on biodiversity. We know that population growth is continuing. Um, and the world population at the moment is at 6.7 billion. By 2050, it will be at over 9, 9 billion. Where, what are those people going to do? What are they going to live off? Where are they going to be? It's very likely that there will be increased migration because of that. Climate change is a huge one. What are we going to do when parts of the world become drier? People don't have enough water. The climate changes and agricultural patterns have to change. Some areas will become more marginal. People can't farm, can't keep livestock anymore. They'll turn to natural resources, but if that isn't a good enough safety net, they're going to migrate. And, and sea level rise as well is going to move a lot of people from coastlines, particularly in developing countries where people are much more vulnerable, resilience is lower, and adaptation is going to be, is going to be problematic. Uh, globalization and trade. Liberalization of trade is, is already having big impacts. People are moving into new areas where new agriculture is opening up, where, where new forestry is opening up, and so on. And this is only going to accelerate. So not necessarily a very uh, happy picture for the future. The next thing we did was look at, well, what can we as the conservation sector do about this? Uh, what are the interventions that are possible? And these are interventions both at field level. So what can we advise conservation practitioners running conservation projects to do? But what can we also do at policy level, policy level at national level, maybe even regional and, and global level? Can the next slide, please. Um, and you can just skip that, actually. 
So looking first at, at policy interventions, um, very often migration isn't really considered when, when policies are developed. And it would be great if a, a migration screen could be included as policies are developed. There may be environmental impact assessments of policies, but, but the migration factor often isn't, isn't considered. Um, and this applies for economic development policies, and then also for sectoral policies, immigration policies themselves, obviously, but then also land policy, agricultural policy, forest and water and wildlife and so on, have huge impacts on, on migration, potentially. Uh, subsidies, agricultural subsidies, um, including subsidies in developed countries, have huge, huge impacts around the world. Trade tariffs and tax incentives. Um, and then this doesn't just apply to national policy, it also applies to international policies. Uh, for example, CITES, the International Convention on the Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, the Climate, Climate Change Convention. Um, Indigenous Peoples Convention. So there are many international conventions that, that can affect migration. And then also indigenous peoples policies uh, at national level and even at organizational level. Uh, WWF, for example, we have an indigenous peoples policy. Okay. So there are some things that can be considered at policy level by thinking before the policy is developed, you know, doing, a, doing an impact assessment. We can also work in the areas of origin, where are the migrants coming from? Why are they, if we can understand why they're coming, maybe there are things we can do to help them to stay there so that they don't move into sensitive areas, areas of high biodiversity. Uh, one of the first things that we can do is, is try and see if we can improve access to land and resources. Very often there's a very inequitable distribution of land which has probably pushed the poorer people to more marginal land and to smaller plots. And this, this happens as well as, as population increases and, and as a father will subdivide his plot to hand down to his sons. If there are ways to increase people's access to land and to resources, there may be less need to migrate. And this includes intensifying agriculture, improving natural resource use to, to use resources in a more sustainable way, improving livelihoods. This may include off-farm livelihoods if, if farmland and, and farm productivity is limited. Um, making arrangements for retrenched workers is an important one. In the Zambian case study, we were looking at the impacts of the closure of the copper mines in the copper belt. And the retrenched miners were moving out of the mining towns into the rural areas nearby and turning to agriculture, turning to charcoal uh, in the Miombo woodlands and having a big impact. So if companies can make arrangements for workers when they're laying them off, if alternative employment can be found so that they don't have to turn back to the land and back to the resources, can really reduce the impacts. Um, I, I talked about the expectations that are created when early family members come back and say, oh, it's, you know, it's great over there, the, 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 the farm's paved with gold. Really making people understand what the, the true realities are in a, in, in, on the other side, in the frontier, can help a lot in, in helping people to decide whether or not to migrate. And this has been done, for example, in Guatemala, producing radio programs to help migrants understand the true reality of life on the frontier. Um, obviously, providing access to family planning is, is really important for communities who may want to limit their family size but don't have access to family planning. And uh, I'll go on there. So we can, thanks, Jeff. We can also intervene in destination areas. And this is, to be honest, where most of the interventions that we found were taking place. Um, it's where conservation people are, are actually working. We may not be working in the areas of origin. The areas of origin may be a long way away. They may be very agricultural areas where we don't have a huge interest in conservation. And so it may be more difficult for us to work there. If we work in, if we want actions in areas of origin, very often we're going to have to work with the development sector, maybe with humanitarian assistance sectors, and through partnerships encourage some of those activities. But we can often intervene directly in destination areas because that's where we are on the ground. Um, one of the biggest things that we can do is to promote sound land, land use zoning. So those areas which are particularly special for conservation or for local communities, long-term residents, we can zone those um, to, to try and exclude migrant settlement. 
and set aside other areas for migrants which may be more appropriate for agriculture development anyway. Restricting road development is a big one. Um, if you look at the Congo Basin and the Amazon, the pattern of migration settlement that's happened along those roads. So by carefully planning roads and by restricting roads in sensitive areas, this can have a, a really big impact. Um, one of the commonest uh, interventions that we found was law enforcement, sort of trying to beef up to, to, to keep uh, residents, to, to keep migrants out. This can work sometimes. Um, but it's not the only solution. You know, if there are enough migrants, however much law enforcement you do, it won't work alone. Um, guns aren't strong enough. And, and, and you know, I think, I think a lot of the projects were coming to this realization, realizing they have to work with migrants rather than just against them. But law enforcement can be an important part of the set of interventions that are developed. Um, another one is strengthening land and resource tenure of existing residents. This can be very, very important to help people to hold on to their land and, and maintain their own livelihoods uh, so that migrants are discouraged from settling there. Okay, thanks. Um, I mentioned off-farm off livelihood activities in areas of origin. It's also a very important activity in areas of destination. And this includes activities for women. Um, empowering women can make a big difference. Women's education, in fact, is, is really, really important. Um, helping, helping women who, if well-educated, will have smaller families, will be able to develop alternative livelihoods, and so there'll be less pressure. Um, bringing in social services is, is incredibly important. Okay, thanks. What about armed conflict and natural disasters? These are very special situations which can develop very, very quickly. Um, it may be difficult to prepare for them in advance. Uh, one of the things that we found, and this is going back to studies in the Biodiversity Support Program on armed conflict in Africa now, um, during, as conflict starts to escalate, if, if, if the conflict is not too extreme, trying to keep people where they are is a really big part of this. They may no longer be able to farm so effectively. But supporting community livelihoods is very important. Maybe they can have alternative livelihoods through natural resources to keep them in this area and prevent them from having to migrate. But if the conflict escalates and they do have to move, try to reduce the impacts of refugees, internally displaced people. If, if the numbers aren't too great, often they can be successfully integrated into the host communities, at least on a temporary <coughs> basis. Um, they may even be bringing in new technologies that the host communities can use. Uh, if it happens on a big scale, then promoting good practices in refugee camps and camps for internally displaced people is really important. And the, the environment sector has done quite a lot collaborating with humanitarian assistance organizations, developing guidelines with UNHCR and others on this. There's still quite a lot more to do in ensuring that those guidelines are, are implemented. Um, one important thing we did in Mozambique after the last war was to integrate demobilized soldiers back into society. Um, we actually took some of them on in the wildlife department. Uh, these guys were good at handling guns, they were good at living in the bush, they were good trackers, and they responded fairly well to discipline. So they were you know, well on the way to being ideal game scouts and with a bit more training in, in legislation and discipline. It worked out very, very well. So there are all sorts of ways to integrate, to help to integrate demobilized soldiers. Obviously, the conservation sector can't do the whole job because there are large numbers of them, but we can certainly help. And then participating in post-war policy development is also very important to try to um, reduce future migration. So in conclusion, um, migration is incredibly complex. There's never one reason for migration. There are lots of direct and indirect reasons and root causes. We need to have a really good understanding of the situation before we can, we can intervene. And very often we have to do a combination of interventions at, at different levels in order to be effective. Um, I've already mentioned collaborating with other sectors is incredibly important. We need a lot of different partners. Um, development, relief sector, um, population organizations, um, immigration. Uh, just a huge number of other sectors. Um, and we have to monitor our interventions carefully. We haven't 
been very good at doing this in the past. We don't necessarily know if some of the interventions that have been done really, really work, and we need to be much smarter at monitoring them in the future. Thanks. And just to, to finish, some of the, the next steps that we see to this work, um, we definitely need to under, uh, improve our understanding and awareness of migration impacts. Um, and this goes along with the comment on improved monitoring. We need to pilot some of the promising interventions in a way that we can actually measure whether or not they're being effective. Um, because we need to draw lessons in order to be able to provide guidance. The conservation sector needs, desperately needs tools and guidance on, on this issue. We've um, drawn up the sort of uh, a framework for interventions, but we need to provide more detailed guidance on, for people on how to decide which intervention to use under which circumstances. We know that global trends, given global trends, there's going to be a lot more migration in the future. It may be a very different kind of migration as well. So we need to be forward-looking. We shouldn't just be reactive. We should be proactive. We should be looking to see what's coming at us down the pike and um, have interventions ready. And then finally, we need to build our own capacity in order to respond. Um, and this includes building partnerships with other sectors, which is going to be increasingly important for us in all sorts of ways. So, uh, our next step is to move forward with these steps. We're going to be madly fundraising for this and really, really trying to sort of push this out to the field in our next phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, and, and thank you to the Woodrow Wilson Center for having this event, which um, uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity of participating in. Uh, I'm going to tell a story about what happened in Southern Bahia in the decade of the 90s. Uh, today, I, I no longer work in the field in Bahia uh, following this, this story f through th thick and thin. Today, I work at uh, the Human Dimensions Program of the Center for Applied Biodiversity Science in, at CI. And there, uh, we're looking at the global drivers of some of the trends that I'm going to be talking about at a local scale in this presentation. So the link between what uh, I'm talking about in Bahia and what I'm doing now is presented in, 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 the, in Judy's book, Judy and, and Janet's book, as uh, both a, a kind of a conjuncture of climate change and international markets, and that is uh, the trends in uh, tropical crops, especially biofuels, which are going to be planted to reduce climate impacts <coughs> of, of petroleum fuels, uh, but they're going to occupy space in tropical landscapes, uh, probably beginning another cycle of uh, the ex rise and decline of, of tropical crops. The story I'm going to tell here is the story of the rise and decline of cocoa in Bahia. But that story is connected to a global market of cocoa production, which supplies all of the chocolate products that, that people eat all over the world. It is a story of uh, the declining phase of the cocoa cycle. And I think what's unique about uh, this little story is that it shows the connection between biodiversity loss in the declining phase of a uh, tropical production cycle. We usually think of the rising phase, uh, uh, soybeans entering the Sahado or oil palm coming into Malaysia as the place where biodiversity is lost. But uh, at, at Conservation International, we're also worried about some old landscapes, like the Atlantic Forest of Brazil, where only about 5% of the forest is left, but which still retains enormous biodiversity. So even in the declining phase of tropical crop cycles in very devastated landscapes, we're, we're concerned about biodiversity loss. I'm going to be talking about this declining phase of a tropical crop cycle but uh, looking towards interventions that will work at the, at the rising phase as well. Go, go ahead and move the slide. Cocoa grows in 
areas here shown in purple uh, in Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asia, which correspond very closely to what Conservation International calls biodiversity hotspots, places where enormous concentration of endemic species co-occur in, in places where most of the forest habitat has already been lost. Next slide. Um, if uh, you consider the historic cycle of uh, cocoa production for chocolate products, it began, uh, and just click down, uh, it began in Trinidad, whose commercial production ended early in this century, moved on to Ec Ecuador, whose commercial production has now ended. These are landscapes without cocoa for commercial production. They still produce cocoa, but it's not supplying international markets, going into the supply chains of M&M Mars and, and Hershey and Cadbury's and, and all the other producers. Ghana is late in its cycle. Keep going. Uh, Brazil is late in its cycle. They're declining producers, pr providing less and less of the global market for cacao. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is right in the peak. It's the world's largest producer, uh, but is declining probably in the future in favor of the newest producers, uh, Indonesia and especially Vietnam. Uh, one of the interesting things about tropical crops is that unlike uh, temperate crops, they are gypsy uh, crops. They move from their centers of production and families, often migrants, that move into the areas of forest to begin the plantation, planting cocoa trees, which takes six years to mature, these families often grow and uh, move on to other activities but the cocoa that was grown in those areas uh, declines, becomes decrepit, while new migrants in some other part of the world with accessible forests, young people, uh, take on the opportunity of producing the world's supply of, of chocolate's input. Uh, the, the world's foremost expert on this, Francois Roof at CIRAD, uh, has done numerous studies of the correspondence of the cocoa cycle with family age cycle in all of these places. So the older the production landscape, the older the people that are there, and, and, and in each of these cases, it was migrants who supplied the labor, my, internal rural migrants from one part of the country to another that supplied the labor that allowed the expansion of cocoa. Next slide. In the case of Southern Bahia, this just shows the uh, expansion phase in, the, in, in, in when, when Brazil was still the number two supplier of world cocoa, uh, the center of production historically here expanded south, opening this large area of, of, of new production in the 1980s. Uh, in, in this period, you can see large forest fragments were uh, declined considerably. Uh, the remaining biodiversity in the region, next slide, survives in these uh, fragments, often no larger than uh, 50, 100 hectares, uh, many of them still on private lands. Uh, though protected areas have been created, still the biodiversity of the region, which is enormous, uh, depends on fragments whose size is not sufficient for them, but in a landscape with cocoa also planted could, could provide sustainable habitat. Thus, our conservation is concerned not only for the forest patches, but also for the production landscapes, which uh, in the past offered a, 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 a means for the movement of species among, among protected areas. Next slide. But the story of the 1990s, if you look at this, uh, uh, this is shaded according to out-migration from the municipio. So the dark color here shows out-migration uh, the light color here shows growth in population. What, what happened in this period was uh, cocoa prices declined by about uh, from uh, uh, $1,000 a ton to $300 a ton. A new uh, cocoa disease uh, that uh, was uh, co-evolved with cocoa in the Amazon uh, found its way to Bahia, it's uh, Crinipellus perniciosa or witch's broom, which infected the trees. Uh, caused a collapse in production, and of course, the pull factors, which were the growth in production in Cote d'Ivoire and new production centers, was a cheaper source of cacao, uh, and the production scale of the 
buy-in cocoa farms was uneconomic compared to the new producers in the world. Result was that farmers laid off their workers. The workers looking for someplace to go moved to the coast principally where tourism was growing. Next slide. If I overlay on here cocoa production, turn that off, go back and forth on that a couple of times. Look at how closely that corresponds, the decline in population in the rural area to the, to the, to the cocoa region. Uh, I'll tell you the story of this region down here in a minute. That's also the story of agricultural decline. Uh, next slide. The two areas that experienced great uh, out-migration were the, the cocoa production region and this cattle production region here. This area, because of tourism, grew in population. This area grew uh, mainly because that's a new area of soybean production. That's the expansion of the Sahado so soybean economy growing up in this direction uh, 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 in Brazil. Uh, in this period, 156,000 people moved out of that region to, some, to somewhere else, out of the rural areas of that region to somewhere else. Next slide. Um, in the southern part, uh, I don't have deforestation data for this period in the northern part of, of, of southern Bahia, but in the extreme southern part of southern Bahia, one, one thing to notice is that the tourism industry provoked loss of forest fragments among the few fragments that were left here. But also notice in the declining area, uh, we also experienced considerable deforestation. Um, part of that story, I think, will be confirmed as we look at deforestation trends in the, in the cocoa uh, region where much deforestation also occurred. The data are much harder to obtain because of cloud cover. It's very hard to do uh, remote sensing time series analysis, but that's going to come out uh, in the next couple of months. We've finally uh, solved that problem. Next slide. As a result of the out-migration of people from the rural areas, they, where did they go? They went to uh, shanty towns in the urban centers of the region. They went to shanty towns outside the region in Salvador or Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. Or they went to the shanty towns around the, the tourism centers on, on the coast down here. Uh, Life in those shanty towns is, is, is kind of hellish. It's kind of Hobbesian. And because of that, uh, a land reform movement that began in the southern part of Brazil, in, in, in uh, Rio Grande do Sul, moved into this region, uh, organizing people living in shanty towns and saying, look, you're rural people. There should be rural lands. Our constitution says there's enough land in Brazil for people to have land. And as a result, a number of uh, land reform communities were created, often by many different organizing groups of, of different political uh, formation. Uh, next slide. In that period, uh, in a publication uh, in 2005, uh, we showed that in the beginning, the land reform groups uh, because of the violence faced when trying to settle on land of productive cocoa farms, uh, were forced when trying to uh, occupy lands to occupy those lands where they received the least resistance, least violent resistance from the landowner. And those areas were forest areas. So in an area that has on average like 12% of, of forest cover, the farms occupied in the beginning, in the late 80s, had between 40 and 80 percent of forest cover. So the other thing about these farms is that why was there still forest on them when almost all the forest was already gone? Those lands had the poorest soils, very poor uh, sandy soil, uh, great declivity, so that once the forest was removed, uh, Erosion and uh, soil loss was tremendous. As the decade went on, uh, one of the interventions that both WWF and uh, my organization at the time, the Institute for Social and Environmental Studies of Southern Bahia, I started working for CI only in 2001. Uh, for the previous 12 years, I worked in an NGO in Bahia, and many of these data and many of my collaborators are, uh, deserve credit for, for having helped put this together. Next slide. 
the result of some of that, uh, 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 of that land reform has been grim with small producers producing manioc, corn, uh, beans for four or five years, but the soils so poor are unable to sustain that. The properties are re-aggregated into cattle farms, and uh, uh, biodiversity loss is, is put at greater risk. Nonetheless, next slide. Nonetheless, uh, the land reform movement has become increasingly more receptive to work over that period with environmental groups and environmental NGOs in the region. Now there are more than a couple, there are 10 or 12 very good local NGOs in this region and uh, many of them now share information about soil quality with the land reform movement, helping them uh, avoid those places where small-scale agriculture will not be possible. Because uh, they too recognize that some of the economic future jobs in this region is going to come from the tourism industry, uh, click a couple of times here, again, again, uh, the forest loss occurring in, and, and the loss of, of, of cacao, a tree that also holds the soil to the ground, it poses risks, next slide, to the to the future of the tourism industry uh, because that will promote uh, silty water running into the beach, clouding the water, hurting the coral reefs, uh, uh, contaminating the water supply uh, of urban residents. And uh, increasingly, NGOs have been uh, informing about the ecosystem services that are lost and, and trying to uh, increase financing from the Brazilian government to sustain the sustainability of the rural agricultural sector. Next slide. Uh, private sector has also begun to observe this, uh, creating new uh, protected areas on farm and becoming much more receptive to the implementation of laws that require that every farm maintain a permanent reserve of 20% 20, 20 of its area. So many of the NGOs are helping work to implement that, that regulation, which is observed in the breach. Next slide. Uh, we've also worked in that region, we meaning the Brazilian NGOs in that region, have worked uh, often supported by USAID, but uh, increasingly also supported by the European community, uh, which, which has invested in projects in this region, helping to diversify uh, the products that the farmers grow so that the collapse of one commodity doesn't uh, end their ability to survive on the land. Next slide. Uh, Associations are important to this, and uh, this producers' cooperative in Unas, near the, the one of the major protected areas in the region, helps to uh, provide farmers alternatives. Uh, next slide. Uh, this this is a story again of protected areas. One of the newest protected areas in the region is not this. Uh, th this was achieved as a result of mostly a private uh, sector. The European Community is supporting the cacao that it embraces, uh, that is, cacao production with uh, other diversified crops that allows sustainable agriculture to remain as the interstices between forest fragments in these key areas. This, this is an area of, of, of a unique bird species uh, which doesn't have a protected area but whose population, known population, is restricted to that site. Um, next slide. I guess, concluding, one of the things that I would emphasize uh, that's mentioned in the report but deserves more emphasis is that uh, in our work in the cocoa cycle in Bahia that is connected to the cycle of cocoa in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in these places where it is growing, we've increasingly worked with the private sector. M&M &M Mars and other producers of cocoa they don't like the idea of a gypsy crop. It doesn't provide them with a secure, long-term expectation that their main input is going to be there. And they're interested in having uh, inducements that allow the replanting of cacao in areas that, that otherwise would be abandoned. So we need to increasingly co collaborate with the private sector to establish best practices in which uh, cocoa re producers receive preferences in price where the area that they're planting was not recently deforested. Cocoa should come from places that 
is not uh, the result of recent deforestation. There is plenty of tropical land that cocoa can be produced on without expanding into the forests of uh, Sumatra or, or uh, Kalimantan or, or, or Vietnam. Uh, and finally, uh, for, next slide. <clears throat> finally, uh, for the expansion of the rising phase, I mean, most of what I've talked about has been how we need to work to protect these declining tropical landscapes where crops are moving out. And we need to be working on other crops like that, coffee uh, and, and as well. One of the interesting things that we could do besides working on, on uh, the private sector is to begin to work at the same scale as the crops. Uh, we often invest in uh, conservation projects in Ghana and in Vietnam and in uh, Bahia, but rarely do we invest in conservation projects that look at the scale of the tropical crop and try to estimate how its production could occur without uh, 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 producing costs in environmental services. Uh, but in the future, I think the, the, our main concern is going to be working with the, the consuming industries that are going to be purchasing the oil palm, soybeans, uh, switchgrass, and other pro, uh, biofuel inputs so that we can work at the scale that those will be sourced and informing them on how that production can occur without further expanding into areas critical for biodiversity. Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon to each and every one of you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk with you about the Galapagos Islands and the migration challenge uh, that we're confronting in the islands. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have had the good fortune to travel to the Galapagos Islands? No, Jenny has. Okay. So a few of you. Okay, great. Um, so if you wouldn't mind helping me. Okay, so for, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the islands, uh, they're located uh, 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. They're um, owned by Ecuador, and an interesting uh, point that I always like to, to mention is that um, on multiple occasions in the, late 19, um, uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the United States and the UK uh, both attempted to purchase the Galapagos Islands, and fortunately for uh, for the world, um, the United States uh, was uh, not successful at purchasing the Galapagos Islands because we would quite likely have seen a very different Galapagos Islands than the islands that we know and uh, that we know today. In uh, 1959, the government of Ecuador created the Galapagos National Park, setting aside 97 percent of the um, of the land mass as national park. Just uh, is there the the pointer? Is that something there? A little stick. Oh, would you mind? Thanks. Uh, so in 1959, the Galapagos National Park was created. Uh, in 1978, UNESCO declared the Galapagos Islands a World Heritage Site. And in 1998, uh, a very important piece of legislation was passed, the Galapagos Special Law. And I'll mention that a couple of times over the course of the next 10, 15 minutes um, because it is very much related to uh, or is supporting um, our efforts on the migration front. So the Galapagos Special Law was passed in 1998, and it did a number of very important things. One thing that it did is it created the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And the Galapagos Marine Reserve extends 40 miles beyond the outermost islands. It's 50,000 square miles. Um, it's roughly the size of the state of Florida. 
It's uh, one of the largest, the third largest uh, marine protected area in, in the world. And, um, and as you can imagine, it's, uh, it comes along with uh, the, the challenge, the enforcement challenges and planning challenges. And so, so the Galapagos Special Law created the Galapagos Marine Reserve and it also did another very important thing. Uh, it uh, uh, put in place um, uh, language in the law to ban migration to the islands. And if you think about the political will required to do that, it's extraordinary. It would be similar to the United States government saying that people cannot migrate uh, uh, near, for example, Yellowstone National Park. So tremendous political will. Next. Um, you may recognize uh, this uh, creature. It, it had a leading role in uh, the movie The Master and Commander, Russell Crowe's movie. It's a flightless cormorant uh, find, found on a couple of islands um, in, in the western part of the archipelago. Uh, for those of you who um, are familiar with why the islands are so special, um, th there are two very important reasons. One is that 95% of the original biodiversity still remains today. And if you compare that to, for example, the Hawaiian archipelago um, that has lost more than 95% of the original biodiversity, the Galapagos Islands is a huge opportunity. Uh, so, and the, the other thing is that there are very high levels of endemism, species found nowhere else on the planet. For example, this flightless cormorant that has evolved over time into a creature that, uh, that no longer flies. Next, please. Um, this is the island um, of Bartolome, and um, during the past 10 years, the, the conservation community has had a number of very important successes, and I'll just mention two of those successes. Um, we, the, uh, recently, the uh, large-scale uh, UNDP GEF-funded project, the Isabella Project, that focused on the eradication of introduced species on Isabella uh, and Santiago Island and, uh, um, and uh, eradication of pigs on Santiago Island, concluded and um, was uh, largely successful. And the resulting recuperation in the natural ecosystems has been nothing short of remarkable on those islands. The other very important um, accomplishment has been the passage of the Galapagos Special Law, again in 1998, um, that uh, created the Marine Reserve, bans migration to the islands, and the other thing that it, that it, uh, that it does is it bans industrial fishing in the Marine Reserve. So uh, artisanal fishing is permitted, um, but our, uh, industrial fishing is not permitted. And it's those uh, artisanal fisher, fishing community that very much is defending the parameters of the Galapagos Marine Reserve uh, before the pressure um, from the ind industrial fishing sector that continues to uh, attempt to come into the Marine Reserve to fish for tuna. Um, and at the same time, the Galapagos uh, has huge challenges. And those challenges um, I would s sort of group into uh, a couple of different categories. Um, the, the whole set of uh, human, um, the human footprint um, that very much is linked to tourism. So population growth rate, the human footprint, um, tourism, and then uh, fisheries. And I would say that fisheries is, is, a, is a secondary threat, that the real threat in the Galapagos Islands is uh, tourism and the growth in human migration. So I'm going to focus on um, this uh, the, the issue of migration in the Galapagos Islands. So this, this chart, in my mind, or this, these graphs uh, tell the story. Um, the, on the right side, you have the, uh, the resident population, and you'll see that there has been dramatic growth. In the 1980s, the population, the local population was at about 3,000, and today we're sitting at about 28,000, and if this trend continues, um, we'll see a Galapagos Islands that will, that, that will be very, very different in the future. This uh, growth in the local population, uh, is, there's a direct correlation with uh, tourism and the growth in the tourism sector. In the 1980s, the, the, uh, the number of people traveling to the islands was about 14,000. And today, um, we're looking at, uh, as we close on 2007, uh, uh, tourism figures of about 120,000 people. So there's been a dramatic increase. Um, and th this, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, one would be hard-pressed to find 
another example in the, in the world where ecotourism, an ecotourism model and vision has been so successful. In, in the 1980s, the Galapagos largely were considered the, the worthless uh, clinker islands. And at that point, the, um, the, the global tourism community, the government of Ecuador, uh, led by the government of Ecuador, very much put in place um, a plan to grow uh, that sector in the Galapagos Islands. And they've, they've been very successful at it. Um, it's, uh, the government has created the economic and political clout required to protect the islands. Um, and at the same time, it's uh, generating a lot of money into the uh, local and national level um, uh, economies. Um, and there have been negative impacts on biodiversity, but I think that by and large, uh, Charles Darwin would still recognize many of the places that he visited 170 years ago. Um, the other point here I would mention would be that, you know, you'll notice here that the, that the growth in tourism is, is pretty flat, that in addition to the fact that there was no um, proactive ecotourism model in place, uh, this, this also was the time um, when uh, the, there was a, a global recession as well. And um, the, uh, the Ecuadorian government also right here, this is the growth in, um, in Ecuadorians traveling to the islands. Right about here in the early 1990s, the Ecuadorian government put in place a strategy to attract uh, Ecuadorians and uh, Latin Americans to the Galapagos. So you'll see a growth here, not only in uh, well, here, and not only international visitors, uh, but people from Ecuador as well. Next, uh, this uh, this is a, a picture of a little town in in the Galapagos, Puerto Yorda, on the island of Santa Cruz. So so you have a situation where three percent is um, where population centers are permitted. Um, by and large. Uh, Two of those islands, the islands of Santa Cruz and San Cristobal, um, are, are home to most of the population, about 25,000 people. Uh, one other island has about 1,500 people, and another island has about uh, 100 people. So um, the, what, what I want to show here uh, is that, or the point that I want to make is that um, there, uh, as of today, there are no, there's no land use um, uh, zoning planning system in place in the uh, in the areas of the Galapagos Islands where um, people are allowed to live, and that is definitely uh, at the top of our list um, as a, a priority for the conservation community. Next, please. So over the course of the last uh, 10, 15 years with the growth in the tourism sector, it's presented enormous challenges for um, local municipalities and government. This is just a snapshot of the way that uh, the local municipalities are uh, disposing of waste. Um, basically, everything's hauled up into the highlands and thrown in a pit and burned. I was actually there about uh, five months ago with a team of people from Toyota that are working with us in the, with the World Wildlife Fund and the municipalities on putting in place a sustainable waste management system. And this fellow that I was traveling with from Toyota jumped down into actually this pit and pulled out an eight-gallon um, can of benzene. It's actually right here, this green thing. Um, and benzene, this right here, this plastic container. Benzene is used to um, clean motors. Uh, the fishermen use them to clean motors. So um, it's a real problem in terms of just the whole set of issues around the human footprint and waste management. Next. So uh, briefly, uh, what's working? Are there, there are a lot of things that, that are, um, a lot of things that are working largely, I, I would say, on the policy front. Um, the Galapagos Special Law in 1998 banned, uh, bans migration to the, uh, to the Galapagos. Um, uh, there was a new president that came into office uh, this past January, and he has demonstrated extraordinary political will to address and to, um, to address the challenges in the islands and to address the migration and population growth rate challenge in particular. Um, in uh, March, he issued a decree uh, calling for a new tourism model to be developed for the Galapagos Islands that uh, ensures greater benefits for the local economy and that addresses head-on the issue of migration and sustainability and carrying capacity. Um, globally, 
uh, within the global context, uh, UNESCO recently declared Galapagos an endangered world heritage site, and at the front of that, uh, anal that set of analyses and recommendations is the issue of migration and the need uh, to uh, address that issue. Uh, there's a new governor that has recently been appointed in the Galapagos Islands who is a conservation leader. Uh, his name is Eliezer Cruz. He was the head of the Galapagos National Park for eight years, and then he was our uh, World Wildlife Fund's director uh, in the islands for three years, and he left a couple of months ago to become governor of the islands, and he has as his mandate to address the migration um, issue in the islands. Um, there is also a new tourism model that's under revision, and um, there's also, you might have seen about two weeks ago, there was, I guess a week ago Sunday, there was an election in Ecuador, uh, and the, the uh, country is going to be mo moving forward with a rewrite of the Constitution, the Ecuadorian Constitution. And, uh, and within the context of the, of the parties that, the party that will dominate that rewrite, we're confident that, uh, that the Galapagos Islands and uh, the, the Marine Reserve as well as the migration issues will be um, represented uh, in a way that uh, is positive for uh, conservation in the islands. Uh, the president uh, in September, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, took a very important step. For three years, we have been waiting for the president to sign the uh, migration subregulation. Uh, the the subregulation is the sort of the teeth to the Galapagos special law that will allow the local authorities to move forward with implementing that law. So this was a, a huge step and the President of Ecuador uh, should be applauded for this. And uh, another, um, I would say, in, in addition, there is by and large um, significant awareness among the local population of the, adv of the, advantage, uh, the advantages of the Galapagos Special Law to, to them as residents of the Galapagos Islands um, and also the importance of them caring about the, um, the growth in migration to the islands and why, uh, and why it's relevant to them and why, should they, and why they should care. And so there's increasing support uh, to implement the regulation, uh, uh, the migration regulation. Next, please. So what's not, not working? Um, while migration to the islands has slowed down, uh, the migration continues. Um, this, it's not surprising. Uh, until the subregulation, migration subregulation is passed and, and can be implemented, um, we won't be able to uh, bring the numbers down uh, to, uh, to, to a, a manageable, or not manageable, but we won't be able to halt migration to the islands. But we're now poised to be able to, to do that with the passage of the subregulation. The uh, capacity of the local or the, the National Institute of Galapagos in Gala um, and the Galapagos National Park Service to enforce migration is, is limited and uh, the, um, the challenge is to work with them, uh, with those organizations to ensure they have the capacity to move forward with implementing the, the migration subregulation. And the other issue is that the local labor pool is, in, in some cases, insufficient. If you were to go to the islands t today and talk with one of the large tour operators or any tour operator, they would tell you that uh, if they have the need for an electrician, for example, that it's nearly impossible to find skilled electricians or mechanics. Uh, on the islands, so this uh, results in um, the uh, the tourism sector uh, bringing people from the mainland with uh, those skill sets, uh, and at the same time, uh, the tourism sector is uh, bringing people onto the islands um, uh, who who have similar skills as those who live in the islands, just because it's cheaper. Um, the Galapagos Special Law also requires that uh, people who um, our residents of the Galapagos Islands, that the, they're paid more than uh, the minimum wage uh, on mainland Ecuador. So, um, so it's uh, less expensive for the tourism sector to bring uh, people who can clean hotel rooms um, and clean ships and, and things like that, to, just to bring them from the mainland. Next, please. 
So some, some of the questions that we ask ourselves at World Wildlife Fund, the, uh, the, the team that we, uh, works on the Galapagos, um, these are some, some of the questions that we're you know, always asking ourselves is how do we you know, balance the trade-offs between environmental protection and um, the well-being of, of citizens? Uh, how far as a conservation organization should we go to address the population growth uh, issue in the islands? Uh, do we, you know, should we be fighting it on all fronts? Should we be uh, talking about repatriation packages? Should we be incorporating family planning uh, into our uh, conservation program in the islands? Um, and how best do we move forward with building the capacity of Ingala and the Galapagos National Park to um, uh, implement the uh, migration subregulation? Next, please. And moving forward, and today at this time and, and in the future, World Wildlife Fund will be focusing our efforts on strengthening the capacity of Angola. Right now we are putting, working with Angola to put in place systems at the airports to um, issue transit cards. Uh, when you travel out to the islands, um, y there's no um, systematic documentation of who's arriving and who's leaving. So that's something that we're focusing on now as uh, one of the first steps, putting in place a system to track people coming and going. It should be pretty easy because there's uh, really two points of entry San on San Cristobal and Santa Cruz Island. And at the same time, uh, we're about six months into a process of documenting um, every single person who documenting the uh, resident status of everyone who's living in the islands. Uh, they are having to submit um, the legal documentation that shows that they're a, a legal resident of the Galapagos Islands and if you were living there before the passage of the special law you're, you're entitled to that residency status or if you're there on a temporary basis. So the idea is that with a system uh, in place in, in the airports and at the points of entry coupled with um, um, a systematic way of documenting who's there legally and illegally will begin to get at the um, at, at the sort of the, the challenge of um, monitoring, controlling uh, uh, the population uh, growth and set of migration um, and the, and migration to the islands. Um, and the the other thing that that I would mention is that the uh, president of Ecuador has recently stated that um, that he intends to um, remove. Uh, there's a um, there are probably three to five thousand people who are uh, in the islands uh, uh, illegally, and that he intends to uh, remove those people from the islands. So that's going to be interesting um, to see how that that's going to happen. You're going to have to have. Um, capacity built also within the, um, the Ecuadorian uh, sort of Navy structure and police structure in the islands to make that happen. And when you think about limited flights out to the islands and how you would go about gathering people and removing them, it's, <laughs> it, it's going to be a challenge. So um, I'll just leave it at that and um, we can, if you have questions we can take those later. Thank you. Thanks. I want to uh, very much uh, express my appreciation to the Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, inviting this former follow fellow back to uh, this very room where I sat many times listening to uh, presentations. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I was thinking about and working on uh, was the population environment uh, uh, connection uh, when I was uh, during my when I was here during my fellowship time. Um, in my remarks, uh, I want to move uh, briefly through a few ideas because I know time is pressing. Some people have to leave, and I'm sure many of you have uh, questions for our uh, panelists. Um, in my time, however, I'd, I'd like to um, give you a few thoughts. And let me start in the next slide uh, with just some things to take away, and then I'll try to elaborate uh, on those. Um, uh, first of all, when, when I looked at this report um, and, and read it, um, I certainly saw it as a clear step forward in understanding an element of population dynamics uh, here, migration and environmental outcomes. Um, 
The report uh, talks about the links uh, that migration brings from origin and destination, the links of, of population behavior and various kinds of environmental activity. Um, it also uh, shows a concern, I think, uh, throughout the uh, report for the incentives that individual actors here face. And very often um, we don't see enough of that sort of discussion. And I would, in fact, uh, in my comments, or, or if I don't get a chance to, I'll leave it here in my comments, I would actually push those working in this area and writing future reports to think more uh, carefully and more thoroughly about the various incentives that individuals, particularly people on the ground nearby to these sensitive areas, face. Um, there is also a, an attention to um, local conditions, social institutions. And again, I'd like to see that more developed. And issues of security and strife. And I think one of the messages that comes through quite clearly in the report uh, and through the work of the center and elsewhere is that um, civil strife or international strife of uh, various sorts uh, is often extraordinarily deleterious for the environment. And so uh, some of the things that we might do in the international relations realm that don't seem to be anything ab about the environment at first pass are in fact quite informative or quite consequential for environmental outcomes. Um, and what I really like about the report is it calls on the conservation sector to come in uh, and take a look at migration, population distribution, and so forth. Um, what I want to do is, is encourage you to uh, recast or broaden the framework and embed my discussion of migration, that word that I use as a demographer, uh, into a wider uh, framework. I want to ask questions of, well, is it always migrants, in fact, that we want to be looking at here as, uh, as the group of people? Is it migration as the behavior of the population that we care about uh, most, most directly? So let me pose those as questions now and think about over the course of reading the report or thinking about the presentations you've heard uh, about those sorts of uh, issues. Uh, I'd also like to suggest we want to unpack kinds of migration. Uh, the report does a wonderful job uh, of laying out various streams of migration rural, rural, urban, rural, and so forth. And you heard in uh, the very first presentation by Judy the very important part of rural, rural migration in this uh, story. And we want to think a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, I'd like to use some alternative jargon of my field to talk about population distribution and redistribution as the set of terms that describe what's relevant for environmental outcomes. That subsumes uh, migration. My good friends who are geographers uh, would talk about the settlement system. That's a good enough terminology as, as well. Um, and I also want to talk about migration and economic betterment. I think uh, there was a sub-theme in here that uh, the well-being of individuals uh, on the ground in developing countries in particular near these uh, various conservation impacted zones uh, is very important. I want to underscore that. Um, I also want to argue and present, if time allows, a, a slide or two from my work in Ghana uh, that seems to suggest maybe even public policy can matter in moderate and lower income uh, countries. And uh, finally, my message is that uh, the next steps here, where the report concludes with uh, forward-looking, the two presentations, three presentations we've heard uh, today have talked uh, about next steps. Um, what I'm going to encourage you to think about is how do we dig more deeply into this? How do we actually understand human behavior within, nearby, and influencing these particular kinds of uh, protected areas or the broader uh, kind of set of uh, environmental impacts that are of interest uh, to us? So let me begin to flesh this out uh, for a few minutes here. Um, when I teach uh, and guest lecture in environment courses at uh, Brown, my home institution, uh, I often show our students uh, this front page or cover from The Economist of a few years ago on the run-up to the Johannesburg Summit. Um, I'm sure you all know The Economist, and uh, they uh, put this cover on uh, sustaining his development, and in case you can't see it very well, it shows uh, an African man, uh, probably from Central Africa, drinking from a calabash, and of course raising the very question of if you're going to sustain development, if you're going to protect the environment, well, what about sustaining the development of the ordinary people uh, on the ground? And I would suggest to us that one of the fundamental institutions or one of the fundamental issues that we need to think about is this issue of equality and income and level of economic development in these countries that has an influence on their own environmental uh, trajectory and has an influence on what the individuals within the country will contribute to environmental amelioration. Um, in the next slide, um, another slide that I used in some of my presentations uh, 
actually matches up with uh, a citation, one of the very first citations in the report. It's uh, uh, by a, a couple of individuals entitled Nature's Place, and it shows some issues of um, various dynamics and environmental outcomes. And if you get a chance to take a look at that, you'll see at the very center of the picture is population growth, and it feeds out through food demand, shelter demand, and so forth to a, a variety of environmental outcomes, housing sprawl, urban concentration, and so forth, leading to various kinds of pollution, land cover loss, species loss, biodiversity loss. Um, what that's a very profound reminder about is the way in which population dynamics are so often seen as the central or certainly one of the key drivers of environmental outcomes. And for sure that's true. Uh, that population is related to the outcomes. Obviously, uh, if there were no people around, the world would look a different place. Uh, but take a look at the next slide, um, which um, gives us a sense of some of the issues that we might think about or might cause us to think about uh, a reasoning between population dynamics and environmental outcomes. Uh, let me just sort of take you through this picture. It, it, it's, I'm taking you back to the United States now. We're going to talk about the bald eagle population. And that vaunted uh, publication, Science, uh, raised the issue in June about whether the bald eagle should be delisted because it's made such a, uh, a recovery. Um, if we look at the bald eagle population going back to the 1960s and uh, up to here 2000 where my graph ends, you see there's a fairly substantial recovery of the bald eagle population. Happy news for most Americans and most uh, conservationists. And if we look, however, at the companion trend of uh, the foreign-born population or immigration to the United States, we see that uh, that's had a big upswing as well during the very same time. Uh, so one might be led to believe that if we really want to secure the future of the bald eagle, what we need to do in the United States is admit more immigrants, right? More immigrants, more people is more uh, secure future for the um, uh, bald eagle. Now, I realize some of you are laughing. It's a silly proposition. But my point here is not about the bald eagle and immigration. My point is here about how do we think about population dynamics and environmental outcomes. So what we want to do is to unpack the various kinds of things that we have here. Obviously, there's no simple relationship between somebody coming across to the United States and uh, the bald eagle recovering. Uh, but there are other trends going in parallel uh, that are driving some of both of these things. And what we want to do is when we work in another country, in one of the several sites that are some of the examples or case studies in the report, or when we think beyond it and what can we generalize, we want to back up and talk a little bit about or think a little bit about uh, the kinds of population phenomena we're looking at, what's driving them, and the kinds of environmental outcomes we're seeing, what's driving them, and then work a little bit harder at the connection uh, between the two. Uh, so uh, let me give you another uh, example of that in uh, this case, but now coming down, I think, a little bit more uh, closely to uh, the ground. Um, a good example that I think of, of um, the contrast or the path that's faced is to contrast Ghana with the United Kingdom here and uh, think about what the environmental consequences are for this tropical country that has about the same um, land area, about 92,000 uh, square miles in both Ghana and the UK, but a population that's on the order of a third or maybe a little more than that now, uh, and a birth rate that's significantly higher, and, uh, but a, a per capita income level that's one-tenth or one-fifteenth or whatever, depending on how you, uh, you measure it. So if Ghana is going to develop uh, and get to where the UK is now, what's the environmental path? What is the environmental set of consequences that will follow from that? Because some of those Ghanaians are uh, like your guy uh, on the front of The Economist drinking from the, from the calabash. And so we want to think a little bit about uh, that kind of issue uh, today. Um, so returning back to some more general comments about the, um, uh, the report. Oh, you can hold on to that for a minute, Jeff. Thanks. Um, what, what I want to underscore here is that shows, uh, for one of the first times I've seen, broad awareness of the issue of migration and, and awareness of the fact that you can have sudden, large-scale shifts in population in and near uh, areas of environmental concern. Uh, it also shows a respect for indigenous populations and their needs, whether socioeconomic or other, uh, and it clearly acknowledges uh, some of the key issues here that face the conservation community, the development community, 
the local political community in the various countries. Uh, capacity is something that came up repeatedly in the presentations this morning. I want to underscore that, that capacity is an important kind of issue. Enforcement, uh, both from a political point of view and perhaps from a policing or monitoring point of view, and in terms of providing resources for enforcement are critical elements of being able to carry this off. Um, as I mentioned before, I applaud the authors for pulling together the awareness of strife and disasters or environmental uh, disasters and discontinuities themselves for producing some of the movement and some of the connections that we see. And finally, uh, I'm going to encourage again people to look a little bit more carefully at incentives, but we see embedded throughout the report a lot of concern about the incentives that various kinds of key actors uh, uh, face. Uh, much of the report is oriented, I think, uh, towards concerns about very selected uh, environmentally sensitive areas. And certainly we want to have different kinds of attention uh, focused on those than countrywide, nationwide, or worldwide concerns about um, environment as well. Uh, these are relatively bounded zones that are being considered, but I think the report goes beyond that. I'd like to encourage people to think about expanding the frame, particularly as they talk about human behavior, and think about where this human behavior originates and how it evolves. Um, again, returning to my Ghana-UK comparison, I'd like to suggest that um, thinking about what path a country or what path a region, uh, a local political entity can take is a very worthwhile way of framing uh, the debate and framing the questions. Um, I have some thoughts about the migration component of this because I wear a hat of a, a demographer. And let me just say briefly a couple of aspects of that that you may want to take away uh, from this uh, conversation. Um, certainly, migration is a needed uh, recognition. Unpacking the kinds of migration or disentangling the kinds of migration we see is a great step forward, uh, particularly noting the relative importance of rural-rural migration. Although a lot of that rural-rural migration is related to family change and even more fundamentally to, to marriage. So we want to be able to unpack further the kinds of things that are linked more closely to economic activity or to resource exploitation than to just the joining and rejoining uh, and splitting up of households. Uh, there's some discussion of the benefit and costs of migration in the area. Um, and as I think Judy mentioned in the outset of her, her report, uh, she's concentrating in the overall report and in her PowerPoint presentation on some of the negative aspects of migration. But I want to also make an argument that not only do we need do we know that there are some positive aspects of migration, but in fact we want to take a look at how the positive aspects of migration, if there are some, might have positive outcomes for the environment. We may learn some things there uh, that we wouldn't otherwise learn to apply to these areas of uh, deep concern. Um, it finally shows the need, I think, for on-the-ground studies. You had a, uh, some case studies here, and I think that those were particularly um, informative and perhaps would challenge us to push a little bit further into gathering more information about the connection between human behavior on the ground and environmental outcomes on the ground in these uh, locations. Now let me take you to an example from, uh, from Ghana, if I may. Uh, this is uh, a paper that I uh, uh, worked on recently and published recently with uh, colleagues at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana and the Graduate School of Oceanography at URI, University of Rhode Island. Um, and I'm going to take you to lagoons here. We were concerned about urbanization and lagoon pollution. Uh, lagoons are important, of course, for the local economy since uh, the fish breed there and there are a number of other important aspects of them. But we're concerned about what might be the relationship between population density and uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which uh, is out of my orbit professionally but is a measure of uh, human impact on a, a lagoon or an area. Um, and one simple thought was, well, the more population in the area, the greater the population density, the more impacted the lagoon is going to be, and the more polluted it's going to be. Um, and when we looked at the data for Ghana, I was a bit skeptical about whether we would find that. Uh, and my uh, URI, JSO, Graduate School of Oceanography colleagues were across the board on what they thought we'd find. But in fact, if we press the next button, we see that in Ghana, this red circle or red oval indicates the fact that we find a fairly strong relationship between uh, population density and uh, pollution in the lagoons. But now let's press the next button, 
and take a look at the United States where my colleagues also had uh, information on population density and saltwater pond or uh, ecosy uh, coastal ecosystem uh, pollution and find that there's really not a relationship in the United States. Why might that be? Well, uh, the United States is at a different place of economic development than Ghana. And the message that I'd like you to take away from this is that economic development can translate directly into environmental amelioration. So these migrants and these individuals in developing countries who are moving for their own economic betterment are maybe part of a wider process that could have some uh, environmentally positive uh, outcomes. And I think I have one more button on this slide uh, to show that uh, in this particular area at the end of the green arrow uh, is a lagoon that we measured called the Muni Lagoon, and it's a Ramsar protected wetland, and it's one of those international conventions, the Ramsar uh, Wetland uh, Convention, and Ghana is a signatory. And what I'm showing you there on this dot is that that, that particular Muni Lagoon is less polluted than you would expect it to be. It's down below the line on the basis of its population density. So it's an interesting story here that even in a country as modestly developed as Ghana, uh, with all the struggles of all the other areas that we've seen in these case studies, there seems to be an ability, um, some capacity for protecting uh, a watershed and actually having less impact. And if I look at other variables or other indicators of human impact on the uh, watershed environment, we'd see similar sorts of things with um, Muni Lagoon. So that takes me to some thoughts about uh, uh, policy. Could you go back one? I'm going to skip that particular slide. Um, uh, Jeff, um, and try to talk a little bit about some of the policy uh, issues and then uh, spend a moment on the future. Um, so a number of policy issues have been raised this morning or early this afternoon. Some of it was very general in the report all of, overall and some were in particular uh, elements and I'm just going to talk about them substantively without identifying particular parts of the presentation. Um, some policies that were mentioned, economic development. Certainly I support that. In my own terminology, I would suggest that economic development can help hasten what I would call the environmental transition. Redirecting resources of improved economic development towards environmental amelioration. And that's something that middle income and in, uh, lower income countries uh, can do. If environmental quality is a superior good, if you like to use the words of economists, then as people's incomes improve, they may in fact want to see their environment uh, cleaned up. Uh, conventions and agreements were mentioned. I think there is some hope for those. I'm very optimistic from my Ghana results that in fact uh, being a signatory uh, can be helpful. Um, Land use and zoning, I think, are real important areas, particularly as we're talking about land surface, land use, land cover issues for uh, intervention. Recognizing the demands of the local population as well. Uh, land tenure was mentioned uh, at several points uh, overall as an issue, and it came up in the uh, presentation about uh, Bahia. Um, I, again, think that is a very important area to intervene. A lot of institutional structures exist in places that encourage mismanagement, if you like to think of it environmentally, mismanagement of resources or redirecting of things to overconsume what would be done in another uh, circumstance. And lastly, capacity building, I think, is certainly something that uh, we would all support, and we've seen several examples of that. Uh, remember, that costs money, and somebody somewhere has to start kicking in the funds uh, to provide for that capacity building. There are a couple of points in which individuals mentioned reducing migration as a, um, a goal in it, of itself, uh, field level interventions to help them stay back in the origin communities. As a migration demographer, I'm fairly skeptical about whether that is a good use of intellectual, political, and economic resources uh, because people move for fairly rational reasons and rather it might be better to understand the population resettlement process that's going on and then maybe redirect that or understand it or help tap the uh, human resources that are there uh, to provide more environmental uh, protection. Similarly, restricting settlement in potential destination zones and restricting road development and so forth have some of the same components uh, embedded in them where uh, local capacity or local incentives might be difficult to uh, completely constrain here, and so therefore it might be better to take into account what's driving uh, the underlying process and then maybe accommodating or in some degree um, regulating it. And lastly, let me come then to uh, the future. Um, 
And as we go to that, uh, Nick, one more slide down. Um, as we come to that, I want to mention on the policy front, I think we had a great uh, couple of examples here, the Bahia and the Galapagos. Think a little bit about what you can take away from those uh, uh, case studies uh, here, um, uh, particularly, or all of our case studies. Think about the, whether there were special circumstances, uh, an island, for instance, or a lot of international attention that helped drive the more positive outcomes we see in one place uh, versus the economic fluctuations faced by the local people in another place, say in the cocoa-growing uh, cocoa regions. So as we think about the future, wearing my demographer's hat again, urbanization is likely to continue worldwide, most notably in developing study and, and countries, so a net rebalance of population from rural to urban areas. This may promote economic growth. This may also create some problems associated with urban sprawl, as we would call it here, and we need to think a little bit about uh, what the consequences of that uh, might be. Uh, another thing that uh, we're likely to see, uh, we can go down a couple more, uh, is that migration is likely to increase. This is in the report already and was already mentioned in the presentation this morning. Certainly international migration is likely to in increase, that is to say migration across national, national borders. But maybe more importantly for the conservation community, internal migration is probably likely to increase. It almost always does with economic development. Um, and we're likely to see more and more movement of individuals across states or provinces or regional borders as uh, populations change. Not all of that need to be deleterious for environmental concerns, uh, but it's something that would certainly promote or be a, a cause for attention uh, from the conservation community in terms of the link between migration and the environment. Um, and I want people to think about alternative paths. So if we think of a country or a region now uh, and its environmental circumstances and that we want to preserve things or we want to improve things, what are the choices that we face or what are the choices that that region or that country faces as it strives to, to develop economically? Think a bit about the case of Ghana and the UK. If it wants to be where the UK is now uh, in some uh, future point, what does it do to develop? And then what does it do to preserve its environment. I want to argue to you, and although I can't develop the point, that local people in these countries are very much concerned about the environment. That's what some of our research shows. They have a different viewpoint on it, perhaps, than uh, people from other parts of the world. Um, but there is an opportunity to tap that and then to harness economic development, perhaps in a way that is more beneficial for environmental conservation uh, than otherwise. And um, let me return finally to my uh, original point that I think we've got a, a great clear step forward here in this report for understanding the relationship between population distribution and redistribution or migration and environmental outcomes uh, with people on the move. And I'm going to encourage people here to dig quite a bit more deeply to understand that relationship in a more refined way so that we can help uh, both promote economic development and environmental conservation in the future. Thank you. Perhaps if I could uh, ask Keith and Lauren to come around so you can use the microphones and Judy as well for the Q&A. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, and Michael, too, we need to get you in front of a, a mic uh, for questions. Uh, so we have some time for Q&A. Um, I ask that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, allow one of my colleagues to come uh, bring a microphone to you if you let us know who you are and speak into the microphone so that we can um, capture your question online. So, Keith, please. Uh, who would who would like to uh, kick us off in discussion? We've had a lot thrown at you to digest. So, yes, please, sir. So, just one second, we'll get you a microphone. Right, right there. Good. Uh, a question to Judy. Uh, sir, if you could tell us who you are. Oh, I'm Masood Hassan. I work for the U.S. Export-Import Bank Thanks. in the Environment and Engineering Department. Uh, the project that we support is, is sometime in the very uh, biodiversified area. Uh, during the construction of a project, which could be, you know, from oil and, oil and gas exploration to highway to, to infrastructure, whatever, uh, during construction, there is a temporary migration of few thousands of people. It could last from few months to few years. 
and then during operation you end up with a couple of hundred people or for 30 40 years life of the project my question is what is your experience that this temporary migration of few thousands of people uh, definitely the the biodiversity is impacted but is it permanent impact does it come back later when these people move away from the project and also for a linear project like a, 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 a a highway or a railway going through a very biodiversified area for hundreds of miles after the construction nobody is there but the operation is going through uh, after a few years how this biodiversity is reinstated uh, what's your experience okay Shall I go ahead sure yeah. okay thank you so, good question um, so the first part, uh, does the biodiversity come back after all the construction work and, and so on? Um, yeah, I, it, it depends on circumstances. If, if the project is well handled so that the, the workers, these few thousand workers come in to construct a dam or a road or whatever, and they, they definitely leave afterwards, um, quite often biodiversity recovers. I mean, some purists would say that once a forest, for example, is disturbed, it's never quite the same again. But th there is certainly, a, can be quite a high degree of recovery. It depends on the kind of biological system. But I think what's really, really important here is um, you're bringing in the construction workers, making sure that they do actually leave again. Um, because there are quite a lot of instances where people have been brought in to do construction or, you know, to work on a logging concession or something, the work finishes. It's a bit like the, the copper mines in Zambia as well. If there isn't provision to repatriate those people, to take them back to where they came from, they may hang around when, they, when the jobs disappear and then they may turn to natural resources and they may go hunting and logging and fishing and so on and so forth. So, but I think in a, in a good project that makes sure that the people go back where they've come from, um, that has a much higher um, chance of, of recovery. Um, and on, on the question of roads and railways, uh, it, I think that one of the things that we find is that, um, you know, the project itself may have a relatively small impact. You build a road, well, okay, there's local impacts, but, but you know, direct impact is, is small, but the indirect impact can be big because once you open an area up, particularly with a road, you're opening it up for people to move in to get access to markets and so they tend to come in and if it's a forested area they'll clear and they'll develop agriculture and, and, and you get these successive waves of, of people coming in. Um, if you can control the land use roundabout, that's really, really important. So um, I think very often the impacts of projects, uh, the indirect impacts are much greater than the the direct impacts. Okay. Yes, we have two in the back there. Thank you. Uh, this is, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, Chris Kosnick from USAID. I work in the Natural Resources Management Office. And I'll direct this to, to Judy and Michael. Um, Judy, I'm very happy to see that um, the paper talks about the importance of looking at both the areas of out-migration as well as the areas of in-migration and trying to understand those, those flows. And Michael, I understand, I, I think you made the point that we really have to do some investigation and figure out what the drivers are um, that are causing out-migration and you may be able to, to influence that. But I guess my, my question for Judy is this. Um, you made the point that it's very important that uh, within the conservation community, when we think of landscapes and eco-regions, we need to think more and more about the point of origin of migration and look towards effective networks and partnerships that can uh, perhaps change the incentives uh, and impact that. We, I have not seen very many examples of that. I'm, I'm wondering in your research if you have seen some effective partnerships and what are the types of institutions that are able to work together um, to make sure that you're addressing drivers where people are leaving from as well as um, at the habitat you want to protect? Mm -hmm. Shall I, do you want to, shall I, okay. Um, no, I think that's a really good question. Um, 
and it's it's one that in certainly in the case studies we found many fewer examples of most people were acting where they, they were seeing the impacts and they weren't getting all the way back to the root causes and the areas of origin um, there there are some examples so for example in Madagascar in the spiny forest people are trying to work in the areas of origin um, so for example improving access to markets so that people there can improve their livelihoods and encourage them to stay there improving social services bringing in family planning in in these areas um, working with health partners working working with development organizations and and with um, policy makers designing regional policies to try and and make sure that this happens um, I'm going to pass this question to Jenny, who actually, can you think of other examples from the case studies? I was just trying to think. <laughs> How about Nepal? Um, Nepal is one uh, where we looked at the, the migration of people coming off the foothills down into the Terai Arc. Um, and this is a big challenge for WWF and other conservation partners because we don't particularly work very much in the foothills. Um, we have started now to work with organizations such as CARE, um, trying to promote improved livelihoods and improved social services there. But I would say that's still kind of early stages. We certainly know that we need to do it now. And that's a change that I think we've seen over the last five years, and certainly my own organization, realizing that we need to look beyond just the areas of destination. But it's, it's lagging behind. We need, to, we need to improve it. And, and we need a lot. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to get a very important prompt here from Janet. Um, this is something we really, really do want to focus on as a, as a priority, and uh, you know, both for human development, but but also for for conservation and sustainability. We we do we are desperately trying to fundraise to do more on this. Thanks. Great question. Um, I have a few thoughts uh, about it to add to what you've already heard. Uh, one is to think through the assumptions about. Uh, whole rural urban or rural rural origin destination connection often the the preference uh, is to have the population retained in its origin uh, I think that assumption needs to be uh, questioned often they have an underlying strong economic motive to move uh, if you ask migrants most of them say that they're happier in their destination than they were in their origin uh, and they're glad that they uh, moved even if they're in fairly modest circumstances in the in the destination um, so understanding that process and then maybe accommodating it might be a particularly uh, productive strategy uh, also another thing that's I think related to your uh, question is that there's an awful lot of origin destination connections that are sometimes uh, ignored in the discussion uh, we take a snapshot of the people and where they are now but people move back and forth there may be temporary migration as we heard about in the previous discussion or maybe repeated returns to the origin community. It comes up in the case of HIV AIDS in the report, I know, but it's actually uh, wider than that. Economic migration cycles people back and forth. Uh, and that brings me to my final point. If I may, I'd like to chide my own profession uh, a bit, uh, uh, taking advantage of your question to do so, is that we don't often have really good information about this good data. And I know it's a standard thing for an academician to say we need better data and more studies, but um, a lot of the international population information that we have doesn't capture migration. It doesn't capture small scale, scale geography very well, which is what's important for some of these sensitive zones. And so there's an opportunity to improve our stock of information greatly there. Can I, can I jump in and ask, ask a question? Then we'll go to the one in the back, which is piggybacking a little bit on, on this discussion and also focusing on one of Judy's points. Um, and I think actually one of the fundamental insights of these integrated pop health and environment programs uh, and taking these issues together, which is to ask the folks sitting in the conservation organizations, um, presumably making the case to look at migration and their connections to, with environmental impacts is a reasonably easy sell internally. And so is that, is that a right assumption. And then second, if that is the case, how far along down the continuum does it go in terms of then selling what Judy pointed out, that it can't just be about keeping people out, but it's got to be about working with people in terms of their livelihoods and, and some of the various incentives, as, as, as Michael's pointed out. And is that, um, 
historically we've known that hasn't been necessarily easy sell or we can say it hasn't been a primary focus. It's certainly become a larger focus. But how do you see along that continuum in terms of either your organizations or you can speak more broadly to the field as a whole in terms of your, the willingness or the, the approaches to conservation? Shall I answer? Does anybody else want to answer? Um, uh, migration is an easier sell in many ways that actually than, say, f the family planning approach, which is the other side of the population coin. Um, people understand, you know, at the moment there are 40,000 people uh, just camped on the edge of the Virungas National Park in DRC. People understand we urgently need to get money to buy firewood to take the pressure off the forest and the gorillas and so on and so forth. So, it, yeah, it's easy to get the messages over in our organizations. If it's a, a sudden onset, um, you know, a very spectacular movement like that. It may be a little bit more difficult to make the point when it's a slower migration that trickles in and you don't notice it so much. Um, and then I think the point about, you know, not just keeping people out but working with people, there, there really has been a sea change. I think um, as we've moved from working on species to working in protected areas to working in integrated conservation development projects that work with people immediately around protected areas, and then in the 1990s to working in broader landscapes, ecoregions, hotspots. Um, I think there is a sea change in our organizations, really realizing that, that you know, we, we, the, the barriers have to come down, we have to work with communities, and that there are solutions that can work for both, both local communities and, and for conservation. The challenge comes when you have a lot of people moving around and, and, and coming and going. Um, and you may not have solid social structures there that you can actually sort of work with and develop tenure and so on and so forth. But definitely in general, in terms of working with local communities, yes, I think, I think it's well realized now that, that this is the way that we have to go, that these people are our nearest neighbors, they have to be partners and we have to find um, solutions. It's just when we get people, a lot of people moving around and the big imbalances, um, it makes it that much more challenging. But anybody else? Um, I, I'd say one area that, I, I, if I understand your qu question right, it's, your question is whether inside the conservation organizations working on migration is an easy sell or not. And along a continuum from, um, of, of other sorts of interventions. Um, one area that I think that we're getting a greater understanding is that, uh, it, that we need to uh, work at broader scales. Uh, my presentation was on how a very local scale impact was impact was the result of a global scale industry, mm -hmm. and that we needed to work with that the industry at that scale to be able to not simply displace environmental impacts from one part of the globe to the other. Uh, but and so I think in terms of uh, getting global private sector interest in reducing their footprint, there is, I think, growing understanding that if they neglect that area of their businesses, that it will be bad for them in the long term. Even Walmart is mm -hmm. becoming environmentally conscious, and, and, and that has to be a pretty hard case. <laughs> uh, the area where concretely we're really looking closely at migration, we. If you go to CI's website, we, we issued a, another publication. I, I don't mean to steal your thunder, Judy, but, <laughs> but we, we, we had a publication on the Integrated Infrastructure Network of South America, uh, uh, IRSA project, which is connecting uh, uh, already the interoceanic highway. Can, you can drive on asphalt from ports in Peru to ports on the Atlantic coast of, of Brazil, and soybeans are going to be more easily shipped and transshipped on, on new waterways, a number of new dams with lock systems connecting rivers uh, are going to uh, connect up places and reduce transport costs and allow migration to occur mm -hmm. uh, in ways that are, are, will transform the Amazon. And, and I think there's greater recognition that uh, this is an opportunity not to stop roads, uh, it is an opportunity to uh, generate a lot of uh, 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 mutual interest in minimizing the impact of roads while gaining the development benefits that they 
that they bring. Uh, m most of the rural areas of the Amazon, if you ask people, they want roads. They desperately want roads so they can get to hospitals, so they can get their pharmaceutical, I mean, their pharmacies supplied with antibiotics. So we need to think about ways that those needs can be met with, with uh, infrastructure networks that, that don't um, uh, cut through uh, really highly sensitive biodiversity areas. And, and I think there is greater interest in the conservation organizations of being ahead of the curve uh, on those issues, and that's the area where migration is, is, is very much uh, an easy sell for us. Michael? I'd pick up on that a little bit. It's not just in Brazil that people want roads, right? Uh, <laughs> you can go anywhere around the, uh, around the world, and if you build roads, people move. And so this process of infrastructure development for generalized economic development generates this um, population movement. And I don't know whether migration is an easy sell in the community or not, but you, one of the points that uh, Judy made was that migration can produce dramatic change in a local area, and that's uh, uh, certainly an important thing. Uh, and it may help be a counterpoint to thinking about uh, issues of other kinds of population uh, growth or other kinds of population phenomena to, to uh, balance off those. I think one of the other things that migration does is it brings individuals from different communities, perhaps different ethnic groups or different language groups, into contact with one another. And that's where some of the sticking points are about whether you try to keep people out or accommodate people moving in. What do you do with the, the, or the original population and the new population? And what are the institutional factors that play into, into that is really crucial here. Perfect. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, uh, quite quickly, I might say. Um, but I want to thank you all. We will have uh, as resources on our website, and I'm sure WWF and CI and everyone else does as well, um, links to the report, a summary of this meeting, a uh, video of this meeting so that folks can listen and hear uh, it as well, and perhaps um, uh, some others as well. Keith has given some others, uh, given us some other reports to link to as well. We'll be sure to do that. Uh, I urge those of you who, because there are some questions that we didn't have time for, to come up and, and talk with our panelists. But please join me in thanking uh, the four of them for today's excellent session.